Coming up on this episode of the Unusable Podcast... Copywriting versus UX writing. Useless browser notifications. And how to open Japanese drinks. Hello and welcome to the Unusable Podcast, where we discuss the importance of user experience in technology and the world around us, and talk about great design that just works, or moan about it when it doesn't. Greetings, David Ball. Hello. Do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, please. I'm Andrew Waite, product owner of a SaaS product in Derby. <laughs> Sounds like your new university challenge. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Derby Ball. <laughs> and I'm David Ball, a front-end web and app developer. So, what are we talking about today? Okay, so we got, a while ago, we got a tweet from Laura Parker, and she asked us a question. UX writing and copywriting, is it the same? Is it semantics or are those roles completely different? I'm a freelance UX writer and copywriter. This is Laura saying this. I don't think UX writing and copywriting is the same. I'm in murky waters. So, Andrew, do you know the difference between UX writing and copywriting? I can guess, but I've never seen a formal definition or researched a formal definition. So... Okay, fair enough. I don't really know either, but uh, I think... Okay, (laughs) this this is not a good start to the podcast, is it? I don't know, you don't know. But the thing is it's i don't know if there is a definition i've read a fair amount of articles about this which i can read you out some definitions today okay. but again it does seem a little bit murky and can i undefined. can i take a guess at what, what i would say the definition is okay because in my mind as well i've done quite a bit of copywriting on for both areas just based upon those terminologies and that definition i would say that UX copywriting is more about the persuasive language used on buttons and interfaces to make them clear, to persuade users to take an action, or to make sure users understand what they are doing when they take an action in an interface. However, copywriting, copywriting, I would, well, my instinct is that's more writing at length about a topic. So, for example, on a website promoting your product, you may have a paragraph of text explaining, you know, the advantages and benefits of that product. Does that okay with what your thoughts are? I think so. OK, so a definition that I've got here from a website copywriting course with K's instead of C's is that copywriting is rearranging words to make things sell better. It's a text form of salesmanship. I would agree with that. So if we say that copywriting, because like, like you said, copywriting is all of the content on the on a website, which might be a blog article. It might be content in an email. Mm-hmm. So if all of that is copywriting and it always has a sales focus because a website has a purpose, doesn't usually. It's there to make you take an action, like to buy something or book an event or something like that. So that copywriting is all about, yeah, it says here, salesmanship. I think to me, the volume of content would typically be different. Yeah. So if I think about the, we've just launched a new website for our product. Yeah. And on that website, there is paragraphs of text explaining what the product does Mm -hmm. and the benefits of the product, bullet points, often paired with images. I would say that's copywriting. Yeah. However, in the actual product itself, on the interfaces and the forms and things like that, UX copywriting is more, it's more descriptive. It has to be concise. It has to be really clear what's happening. There are different qualities that you'd actually want in different in each case so i think what you're talking about there is microcopy so microcopy is like the small bits of text now i've got a description about microcopy if you're interested in what that is this is this is possibly ignorant on my part but i i didn't actually know the definition of microcopy i yeah until today so well i've not told you yet well Okay, go ahead. So in an article by Maria de la Riva, she says that microcopy refers to the tiny bits of copy on products. From the label to a call to action button, to the placeholder text in input fields on forms, we use it everywhere on our interfaces. So even though these little clusters of text don't occupy extensive amounts of space, so we're not talking paragraphs and paragraphs, collectively they're the driving force and make a huge difference. Microcopy is responsible for shaping a generous portion of the user experience. So it's mostly text on forms forms and throughout an interface and on buttons and things like that. So imagine that a button says submit and then after a user clicks it, the label changes on submit to sending. And then that small change lets you know that something's happened. That's not really copywriting, but it is 
someone has thought about the experience there and they've provided words to enhance that experience. And then after the word sending might change to done, for example. So yeah. a copywriter might not know the about the whole, hang on a sec, the copywriter might not know about the whole experience, but a UX writer is thinking about a journey, a journey. Yeah. What a user would be doing on a, on a page. So you said once you click the button, the text changes. Yeah. Is it then still a button? Because presumably they can't click it again. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> I think that's... Is that a relevant question? <laughs> Possibly not. Um, I think microcopy, which is something... I didn't know it had a name, but something I think about daily for the product. To you? Yeah, but we, we, when we talk about the interfaces that we're building for the product, and I'm working with you know our designer and the developers that, that build the product, yeah. we do spend a lot of time talking about that and refining that. And sometimes it's very difficult because in our product, there are some quite technical areas. It does some quite technical things. And so it can be very difficult to boil down text to something simple enough that fits, short enough that fits on a button, is concise, but also descriptive of the action that's taking place when it's pressed that, right. that is quite tricky to do and, and it takes time sometimes to come up with the right language but I, I will say it's very satisfying when you do suddenly hit on the perfect word or couple of words that really encapsulates what it does ux writing is like a, a role in its own right so someone can be a ux writer oh, i'm sure it is in a larger organization we, we're a small a small team but yeah, yeah what definitely. i was thinking there is surely isn't it kind of the role of the designer to think about these things not necessarily a writer or is that like you say a only really relevant if you've got a large team. Yeah, I, I think in a in a small team, people wear many hats, and as a team gets larger, then you know the individuals in that team can specialise. You know, I mean, I can't imagine how big a team would have to be before you would hire a specific UX writer. But having said that, organisations as large as Facebook, Google, no doubt, can afford to and would get the benefit from hiring someone specifically in that role. Yeah. I'm going to tell you three things that microcopy does, according to an article by Cynthia Rismis. Yes. So microcopy motivates the user to perform an action, yep. instructs the user, yep. and gives feedback after the user has taken the action. Mm, well, that slightly conflicts, doesn't it, not with the previous description? Not necessarily. It's kind of but, like the example that I gave about... Say, say those three points again. Just repeat those for me. So motivates the user to, to perform an action, instructs the user to yep. perform an action, and then gives feedback after the action has taken right. place. No, okay, you are correct there. I was thinking in the case of something like a form label or a placeholder, but that's the first definition you gave there, which was encouraging them to take an action, isn't it? So, yeah, you know, that's that's what those things are doing. Yeah. So I spend time with my team talking about good microcopy and working out what things should be. But what is good microcopy, do we think? Ooh. Well, I can tell you what good microcopy is according to Maria de la Riva. Okay. So not all microcopy is created equal and you will find some painful examples out there. Good microcopy is compact, aware and charismatic. Aware of what? Uh, aware of the circumstance. Aware of the, yes. Of the so context. aware of how they shape the experience and what the experience is. Ooh, that's vague, isn't it? So the, the way I'm thinking about that, if it being aware, is that on a form, knowing what the form's for and changing what the button label is according to the action that submitting the form takes. So mm. for example, if it's a form for an email, have the button as send. If it's some kind of a user page, have it as save user. Yeah. So is that what, that's how I interpret interpret awareness, is awareness of what the wider context of the user's, user's trying to accomplish. I would say so, yeah, because it says, uh, it needs to be mindful of the product and user goals and understand its purpose in helping those be accomplished. Yeah. So you are just giving instructions to a user, aren't you? So that makes sense. But the, the third point was good microcopy is charming. So even though it's short, doesn't mean that it's boring or stilted. Surely though, that depends on the t appropriate tone for the product. Yeah. So in our case, our product is quite corporate and quite stuffy. So that does mean that any microcopy is accordingly quite straight laced to the point, you know, it, it, there's no humour there. Yeah, I don't think humour is always appropriate, is it? Like, Whereas a consumer facing brand that, you know, has humour as part of it, then yeah, you can get away with being a little bit silly with it. Yeah. Do you remember MailChimp, their website, which is, uh, it's like an app to send out email campaigns. They always used to be a bit silly and they had this monkey as a logo and some kind of fun text and a lot of exclamation marks and it was always a bit kind of jokey and stuff. But yeah, lately, I think because they've become a bit more corporate, they've had to sort of trim all that down, which is kind of a shame because they've lost what was their unique identity. But yeah, I think you just can't be 
jokey in every single situation. And also, if you're trying to just provide an interface to let people get things done, you don't want to start putting jokes in their face. No, but I think I think you can do both. You can get if if you've got the right brand, you can both let people get things done and understand it, but also have a little humor there. So a good example would be a sign up form. So in our product that's a little bit stuffy, we'd probably say, you know, have the button as sign up mm-hmm. or or continue or something quite straight laced. But if you had a more fun product, you could have like let's get started or let's let's go or something a little yeah. bit more a little bit more fun. Yeah. And I suppose that's why you've got to think about the voice. Because this is actually quite this is quite a complicated thing. You the company, the product, the app, the website, whatever you're you're building, that has to have a kind of tone and a voice. And so and that's not always immediately obvious. So say if you got a freelancer to make you a web page, they might not know what that company's uh your company's voice and tone is. They start adding in words on buttons. So it's good to sort of have that defined somewhere. Yeah, I think it's a quality of a, of a good leader as well to be able to communicate that tone and that vision so that the employees instinctively know what good text is. They're not trying to second guess, trying to second guess it. Yeah, so this article by Maria de la Riva says that you should think of three objectives to describe your microcopy's voice and use them as a northern star as you write. I think northern star is in... Yeah, the light in the sky that's guiding you. Yes, the... that. Yeah. So three ob- adjectives to describe your microcopy's voice. Can't think of any. Fun, jokey, corporate, boring. Yeah. Soft, squidgy. Pedantic. Pedantic. <laughs> I want my company to be very pedantic, please. <laughs> Lemon fresh. <laughs> Lemon fresh. That's That's not ambiguous at all. <laughs> if you don't know what lemon fresh means, then uh... you're not part of the club. Yeah, I don't want to be in your lemon fresh club. So we've talked about what good microcopy is. Oh, hold on, I've got more to go. Oh, there's more good microcopy. Okay, so here's here's another example that's that's quite good. So Airbnb has a search field on their website so that you can search for locations, places, things like that. But it's not always obvious what you can search for. So it has a little bit of text inside that says try, and then it has a location written there to sort of give you a little prompt, a little idea. Because just having a blank search form, you could be like, uh, I don't know. Yeah, so like hints. Yeah, it's a hint, but that's kind of also an instruction. So it tells you what to do with that form element. Mm-hmm. It's kind of obvious, isn't it? But I think those sorts of things often get overlooked mm, quite true. easily. I don't think it's as obvious as you as you might think. Yeah. So we, we have something similar in our product where we have like a search, which is a search for business. Mm-hmm. And then underneath, whenever that someone, this is the first thing that someone will see when they land on, on our app. Yeah. Um, and it's a big search box. It's like almost like the Google homepage dominates, search box only dominates the page. But underneath we have like a, a cycling, rotating set of examples of what you might put in there. So just below the box in light text, it just says, you know, e.g., you know, an example business name or e.g an industry and a location or e.g. Uh, a web address because these are the different things you can type into the search and it will try and find the business based upon that bit of information that you've provided it. Okay, so it changes every few seconds. Is that what you mean by rotating? Yes. Sorry, it's not, not, it's not, not like text spinning around the page. <laughs> <laughs> like some sort yeah. of windmill of text. <laughs> Yeah, and it follows the cursor as you move the mouse around. No, it doesn't do oh, that. Oh, man. No, um, yeah, so... I remember the 90s. Oh, good times. Um, did you ever have a GeoCities site that's total... Oh, I did. GeoCities, amazing. Yeah. Yeah, that's where I started writing HTML. Yeah, me too, actually. Because they had, a, like, a, a page builder that created these pages using uh, tables, and it made absolute awful HTML. So if you So if you wanted something sensible, you had to write it yourself. Yeah. I just remember all the little plugins that you could get and just drop in silly bits of code and things. Quite powerful, really. If you think about it, you can make websites with music and all sorts of things. God, horrible. Horrible, horrible things. Definitely not responsive, though. Wouldn't work on phones. <laughs> well, I don't think anyone had anything but uh, like a 640 by 480 50-inch CRT monitor back then, did they? Yeah, true. So you're, pretty much your audience was on... I mean, I say, I say that. There were obviously differences. I'm being over the top. But there, there can't have been as much variation as we have today in the different devices people would access the website with. True. So microcopy should also be clear and instructional. So for example, imagine you've clicked something and you get a confirmation pop-up. So the option should be clear about what happens next. So yes, delete the file or no, keep the file, for example. And don't have anything weird and confusing like, are you sure you want to cancel? Yes or cancel. Yeah. So we did. That's, a vi- that's horrible. So we did a video uh, that's on YouTube where we play a game called User In Your Face. 
which is like it's a game Every of pattern in one. It's like a, it's like a game of all the most frustrating user experience problems. And they time how fast you can get through it. Yeah, and uh, if you haven't played it, you should Google it by the way uh, and and play it. It's... Or watch the video that we that, that we did playing it, which where it's, I'm just getting frust- more and more frustrated all yeah, the time do, and do just that screaming first <laughs> on our YouTube channel. Then click through and uh, play the game. Yeah, but one of the things that I didn't notice because I didn't see this interface, but if you were to cancel that game halfway through, it says, "Are you sure you want to cancel?" Yes, or cancel. <laughs> Which I just thought, I don't even know if that's even part of the joke, but it just is a joke in itself. <laughs> I mean, I think it must be intentional. It must be, yeah. But it's it's kind of subtle because there's so many websites that I've seen where they make ridiculous mistakes like that. I actually saw, I think it was a tweet the other day where someone had screenshotted Jira on a dialogue in there, which was basically, are you sure you want to cancel? And the options were cancel or cancel. <laughs> <laughs> oh, something's gone wrong there. Yeah. Also things like a feel for creating a new password. So it should microcopy should be instructional. So that's a good place to show to the user the rules for your password. Oh, I so, have a massive pet hate for this. <laughs> what, so where you type in a password and then and then you go, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna use this, and then it goes, actually no, it needs to have four letters and some uppercase characters. And you're like, well, why didn't you say? Well, that is frustrating, but I have a worse bugbear. Go on then. Which is forms where there is a, the requirements are displayed when you set the password up. So when you sign up, you have to type in a password with a uppercase letter, punctuation, numbers, etc. That's fine, okay? Right, annoying, but yeah, okay. Yeah, but then you come back to the site months later. Yeah. And you type in your username and password and it just says wrong. And you type in username and password again and it goes wrong. And you try a different combination and it says wrong. And then what you do is you say, fine, I can't remember what it is. I've forgotten my password. You then go through the whole password reset process and finally get to set a new password. And then it tells you password must contain an uppercase letter and a... A uh, yeah. character, and at that point you go, oh well, if you'd have just told me that, I could have told you what the password was because yeah, I know, so I know what, I know what the ju- rules are now. <laughs> yeah, I know what the rules are now. Now I know what my password would have been. Yeah, I know what you mean, but I suppose they can't tell you all the rules because it's supposed Why? to be super secret and safe. Well, no, anyone would, could, who would sign up for the, presumably it's a free sign up. Anyone could learn the rules just by going to the sign up. Mm, I suppose so. It seems like it seems important that if someone can't remember their password and there were quite over the top rules about what the password should be, well. T- Tell them when, after the first login attempt, even before the first login attempt. But at some point during login, say, that's wrong. Remember, your password has these things in it. Yeah. So apparently Google made a change on their hotel search from book a room yeah. to check availability and had 17% increase in engagement by making that change. Why is that better? Because book a room sounds like if I do something here, that's going to be permanent and I've booked it and I don't, I just want to see, see what I can do. Oh, I see. Okay. Whereas check availability doesn't stop anyone that's committed to going through to purchase. It's not going to make them less likely, but those few people that were non-committal yeah. by changing that text, it's like, oh, I'm just checking availability. I'm not ready to book yet. I'm just just having a look. Okay, so good microcopy can increase what sales because that's what we're talking about there. Oh, of course it can. Yeah, yeah. De- decrease user frustration as well. So we started this by saying that the difference between copywriting and micro copywriting. Copywriting is more about sales and marketing, and micro copy is more about instructional small things throughout an app. Whereas actually, are they both about marketing and sales? I think so, but in different ways. So I would say that take an Amazon listing, for example. Yeah. The text in the page that's talking about the product, what it does, the features, that's copywriting. Yeah. It's written in a sales fashion. So it's trying to persuade you of the, you know, that you need this in your life, that the, the features of, of it are a benefit to you. But none of that's technical. That's not somebody who made the Amazon website is not being creating that. That's just a, someone who's listing a product. Right. So that's so you're talking about copywriting. You're not talking about micro copy because you're not talking about the interface. Ah, no, but I was about to get onto that. Okay, go on. So, so that's obviously persuading someone to sell. Yeah. But the micro copy that's on the add to cart button mm-hmm. and in the little form where you choose the quantity, of course the goal of that is to sell more, mm-hmm. but that's micro copy. I think they can both have the goal to to ultimately sell. Mm-hmm. When you're talking in the context of a business website, it almost certainly always both would be designed to sell. Okay. Have we answered Laura Parker's question yet? Because she was asked 
asking, what's the difference between a copywriter and a UX writer? Now, we've talked about microcopy, but we haven't talked about UX writing. So I've got an article by Nick Babish, who says, UX writing is the practice of crafting UI copy that guides users within a product and helps them interact with it. UI copy includes buttons and menu labels, error messages, security notes, terms and conditions, as well as any instructions on product usage. Now, I was about to say there, that's just microcopy, but then he's also included error messages, security notes, and terms and conditions. Now, surely terms and conditions is going to be like pages of, of content. So isn't that copywriting? That's not microcopy. Terms and conditions is loads of copy. There's nothing micro about it. Yeah, it's not microcopy. You're right. Um, is it copywriting? It's not really persuasive, though, is it? Terms and conditions should be more descriptive and more... They're factual, aren't they? Terms yeah. and conditions are factual. Yeah. Is it part of the experience? I mean, I'd... I would say not really. No, not really. It just kind of has to be there, though, doesn't it? Okay, so he also goes on to say that crafting UI text should be an integral part of the design process. Now, this is where it gets all a bit complicated, because if you've got someone who's a UX designer, they might also work with a UX writer. And so he says... All too often, product developers think of UI text as something that belongs to product documentation phase. Do they? I don't know. First, we'll design the product, then we'll hire someone to help us write some UI copy. Such assumptions often cause a lot of harm because critical UI issues can go unnoticed until the later stages of product development process. Okay, I'm, I'm sure that does happen. In fact, mm. I've seen plenty of terrible products where it needs so much documentation to use what should be just a, an obvious user interface with no documentation. Yeah, so he says that's why UI text should be written earlier in the process. So we always start every project by creating wireframes. And that's like simple, easy, throwaway designs that allow you to sort of visualize and then show to the client how a website or interface is going to work. And then if you need to change it, change it really quickly. You haven't actually spent time building it yet. And part of that process is going to be writing in little bits of microcopy. Yeah, I think so. I think when we're developing new features and interfaces in our product, we would do a similar thing. We would go through a process of, of whiteboarding out the feature. And, and even at that stage, we're talking about what the buttons would have on them, what, yeah. what the, the labels would be for forms. How are we going to make this clear? What are the steps the user is going to go through? And I think it's crucially important to get that right. I think that is it shapes the whole design process. It's, it, it's equally as important as the layout you choose. It's equally as important as the, the visual style it's all really important for creating a, a really slick user experience yeah okay so a few years ago copywriting became one of the most important skills in the web design because of seo so it's not important enough to have a nicely designed website or a nicely coded website because it's the content that matters sure so the better and the more relevant the content is in theory, the higher that will appear in Google search results. Of course. And so that's vitally important. Yeah. So whose responsibility is it to create that sort of content? Is it this UX writer that we've talked about? Or is it a someone who calls himself a copywriter? So, or is this a bit of both? Or is this someone completely so, different? So I think to me that is 100% copywriter. And I can't understand why the UX writer would have any input in that. What? How does, it, how does that help the user? experience in theory because if a ux writer is someone who's planning the whole process then part of that process is getting someone to the website from a search engine maybe i'm just making it up now don't know i don't know if it necessarily is it's almost out of control of your control to a degree because you're, it's information that's going to be presented on google mm -hmm. i mean really what you're talking about is i think the combination of a copywriter and an SEO expert. I would certainly think that the UX expert should be concentrating on right there on the site. Let's make sure that, you know, the micro copy on all the on all the calls to actions, the sign up forms, if it's a if it's a software product inside the platform itself, that's that's where they should be concentrating their time, surely. Hmm. Fair enough. Talking about bad micro copy. Yep. Have you ever used a little digital screen on something? Like what? For example, we have a coffee machine. Yeah. In the office. And it has a little black and white screen. Oh yeah, it's a posh one. And it's about big enough to display about 12 characters or something like that. Right. And so obviously they've got... This coffee machine has quite complicated functions like um, when you need to replace the filter or you need to um, descale it. And there's different procedures you have to do to, to keep the coffee machine clean and in working order. Right. And it has to keep 
communicate that entire process to you in a very, very, very limited number of characters. Oh, right. Okay. And I think that leads to, or div- it's not just that coffee machine, leads to very bad micro copy. What does it say? So, so if you're making a coffee, it tends to be okay because it would say coffee making in progress. So that's fine. <laughs> so robotic but if you go if you is it when you go into the settings and you want to when you want to replace a filter or something like that it'll say like new filter you're like what does that new mean new filter question mark yeah what does that mean am i supposed to put one in now am i is it asking me if i've done it all right okay Do you know what i mean it's not clear you know if it had more space it would be you know have you installed the new filter or something along those lines but one of the ones that's funniest is when it wants to clean itself and it's about to spout a <laughs> load of water out and you need to put a bowl under it because it needs to catch all this hot water it's about to clean itself with what does it say is it just says hot water <laughs> not even hot water exclamation mark no it just says hot water and then it says okay <laughs> hot, hot water, water. i'm okay. going to spray you with hot water now is that okay yeah and so confirm like, like yeah so so once you're experienced with it you know you that means i need to put a bowl under this i've just it's usually one just after it's been clean you want to get rid of the cleaning solution okay yeah. and you have to put a bowl under it and press okay and then it spends 30 seconds just pouring water through itself to rinse all the cleaning fluid out which is fine but I think what I'm trying to say is that sometimes the limitation of the display medium that you have causes bad microcopy. Yeah, but if you've got a big screen on it, you don't want all that explained in a big long sentence. You want it in as concise as possible. It could explain why but, it's going to squirt hot water all out over you. Yeah, but you, I think you could be more descriptive if you had more space. You could say, hot water rinse, please place catch please please catch hot water i'm gonna throw it at you right now ready yeah or like about to rinse please um please place receptacle under spout. <laughs> i don't know I... <laughs> please place receptacle under spout this is why it takes time and it's hard to come up with <laughs> micro copy <laughs> Because you want to be concise, but but genuinely, when we're talking about our product and designing it, we will have brainstorming sessions and we can spend quite a lot of time on, like we don't make coffee machines, but on a problem like that, working out yeah. what, are, what is the really concise way of explaining what's happening. Because it is important, especially yeah. important to get it right. I've got some examples of copywriting that's that's gone bad. Okay. This is on a sign by a political party in the UK, and it says, We plan to cut all homeless people in half by 2025. <laughs> it's not It's not a real sign, it's actually. It's a, it's a joke that somebody's, uh, that somebody's okay. put up. But if it was real, you can sort of imagine that somebody could have written that, thought, that's a great... That's a great saying, and then just got it printed without like really checking it, without running it past, without someone. running it past anyone else. I've got another one, which is an old poster from 1938. Now this is a poster for the Willesden Electricity Department that says, bear, bear in mind this is 1938, so electricity is new, rare. Mm-hmm. It says, "Don't kill your wife with work. Let electricity do it." Oh, <laughs> that took me way too long to get. <laughs> Don't kill your wife with work. Let electricity do it. You're going to give her electric shock. Well, yeah. I mean, you're not going to give her electric shock. No. You're going to yeah. you're going to save her all the time doing whatever 1930s chores you're forcing her to do. And a different age. How sexist. A different age. Can I tell you all about our new Twitter followers? Well, not all about. I'll just tell you the names. Okay. All right. We have got Carolyn Shannon. Howdy. Kevin Rigotti. Howdy. Rohan. Howdy. Rose Keen. Howdy. Diana Howell. Howdy. Steffi Graffy. Howdy. Aina Rahman. Howdy. Sam Rollins. Howdy. Auntie Mikola. Howdy. Pierre Lizette. Howdy. Jeremy Lacroix. Howdy. Andu Odomat. Howdy. Gerard Johnson. Howdy. Feudal Tramp. Feudal Tramp. That's his, that's his name. Well, it might, it's probably not his name, but that's his Twitter name. Mr. and Mrs. Tramp have called their son <laughs> Feudal. Is that... <laughs> It's Twitter. Anything goes. Natalie Simpson. Howdy. Gil Boonick. Howdy. Malkia. Howdy. And Hashim Walid. Howdy. I do strongly believe that we sh- they don't deserve a, a shout out if if they don't have a proper name. I'm going to be nicknamist. <sighs> oh, right. Okay. Be, I was be... wondering what you were talking about there. Oh, what? You th- okay. No. I thought you were going to be racist. No. <laughs> Not at all. I'm, all I'm saying is, if you're called by some silly online handle, like Fiddlesticks, <laughs> then... Oh, Fiddlesticks only followed us the week before. That's why we didn't Okay. Mention okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've got 16 rules of effective UX writing. Do you want to hear those? I'll probably not read them all out. <laughs> 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 this is by... 
Oh, Nick Babich again. Right, we've mentioned some of them already, so I'll go through them briefly. Avoid long box of text. Obvious. No one wants to read huge paragraphs on a website, do they? There's a quote here. I don't know who it's by, but it says, write short and then cut it in half. Ooh. Avoid double negatives. Double negatives increase cognitive load. Oh, right. So can I tell you about something we do in our product in the settings? Can I give an example first? Go so on. a double negative might be, I do not want to unsubscribe. Yes, I totally agree with this. Yeah. Okay. So it's, avoid those. It's slightly relevant, though, to something that, that we have as a policy in our product in Go the on settings. Then. Okay. Our, our product has quite a complex menu of settings that you can customize it with. Mm -hmm. And in there, a lot of those options are on-off switches like checkboxes type things. And originally, before we put a policy in place, some of those would be turning on a negative. Oh. So, the op so the option would be like... Um, disable this feature. Yes. But you're, it looks like you're turning it on to disable it. Yes. The option is, I don't know, um, disable downloads, for example, and you would turn it on. And it's so confusing. You turn it on to disable it. The, the yeah. Really, you want to turn it on to enable it. Yes. Turn it off to disable it. So, so we would just have... Yeah, enable downloads or even just... But it often allows you to omit the word enable. Okay. As, as in what? So say, for example, an option for disable chat widget. If you flip that round so that it's actually... When you when it's enabled, it's a positive action, like enable chat widget. If the context is clear enough, you could just have chat widget. Tick on, tick off. Yeah, okay. I'm turning the chat widget on or I'm turning the chat widget off. I don't need the word disable or enable if everything is always positive action. Makes sense. Got another one. Begin with the objective. When a sentence describes an objective and the action needed to achieve it, start the sentence with the objective. So don't say, tap on the item to see its properties, but you do say, to see the item's properties, tap on it. What do you think of that? I agree with what point is being made, but in the example, I have a different problem. Why? What's the problem? You can't, in most mediums that we work in, you can't guarantee that the user would tap. Oh, okay. Fair a, enough. And not use a different gesture. Yeah. So okay. generally speaking, you should avoid words like click okay. here or tap here, because if the user's using in assistive technology, for example, that wouldn't work. True. Um, you mean if they're using screen readers? Yeah. Or even if you say click here, well, on a phone, you don't click, do you? I you mean, people know what it yeah. means, but, but also it's kind of superfluous if you've worded it well in most cases. Yeah, true. So you can just say, for example, instead of like click here to check out, we'll just have check out. Or yeah, sure, yeah. So make it an obvious button and it just needs to say check out. That That is the action. Consistency. So inconsistency creates confusion. So one typical example of inconsistency is replacing a word with a synonym in different parts of the UI. So for example, you decide to call the process of arranging something scheduling on one layout, but then another part of the website or application, whatever, you call it booking. So having those two different things is confusing. So you should always be consistent. Do you know what? Based upon that, I think we're guilty a little bit of that, and I think we need to resolve that in our settings. I'm Who's we? Make, um, so on the product that I manage. All right, you're falling. Yes. So Don't bring me into it. <laughs> you, you were there at the start. You're, you're, you used to work here. You're as guilty as I am. No, we so we interchangeably use the words audit, scan, report to mean the same thing. Oh. And in some places we do that to almost you know you know if you're writing and it you yeah. avoid using the same word twice because it just sounds odd like Yeah, I know what you mean, yeah. You start to use synonyms so that it, it flows properly. And I think we took that approach with the UX writing, but actually in yeah. UX writing I think repetition is consistency. Consistency. Is... Don't worry about repetition. You should no, just but be consistent. Repetition isn't a problem. Consistency is, yeah. is is more important. Avoid jargon. Here's another one that's obvious. But if you get an error message, don't have it saying something like system error, and then in brackets code, and then a number, followed by a hash or something like that. An authentication error has occurred. Write it in a way that is meaningful to the person who's seeing it. So you might want to say, there's been a sign-in error, you entered an incorrect password. Something that's instructional to them and not weird like computer machine language. I think if you can tell them some instructions on how to fix it as well, that yeah. usually, usually helps. Definitely. Here's one. Write in the active voice. So compare th these two sentences, right? So don't, don't do this. The search button should be clicked when you are ready to search for an item. But do do. Click the search button to search for an article. Can you see the difference? Yes. 
the search button should be clicked. Again, it's more wordy, which I don't like, but it's specifically saying that you should use the active voice, which is click it. It's just very instructional. You're, you're Almost leading. rude, actually. It's like saying yeah. you have to do this. But, but we're used to that on web pages, aren't we? Yeah, but you're getting to the point and you're leading with the action. Yeah. Again, I don't like the fact that it says click and it's encouraging people to use the word click. Don't worry about the clicks. No, I do because you can't know what device someone's using. It goes, I know True. I know we're not really talking about accessibility in this podcast, but it is important. Use the words today, yesterday or tomorrow instead of a date. Oh, yes. Because yes. it's just a bit more human friendly, isn't it? Bit more, pro- I... bit more programming work. I also like saying instead of a date, in some circumstances, like three days ago. Yeah, okay. Or a month ago. A relative date, yeah. Yeah, it, it does depend on context as to whether that's suitable. Like an order date, you'd want it to be specific because yeah. you, you want to know. You're looking like three months down the line, you need to download the invoice, you want to know what I'm looking for the order on this date. But a tweet, you can say three hours ago, three days ago, and that's absolutely fine. Yeah, no one's going to need to time it down to the second. Exactly. And if they do, you could always provide that in some kind of secondary way. So like hovering or something you could... I mean, hovering's bad because that's not possible on the touch device. But yeah, you could have some secondary interface to to reveal the actual specific time if you needed it. Yeah. And that's all I've got by Nick Babich. No idea if I've been saying his name right. Well, you don't see most Twitter followers' names right, so... Could be Nick Babica. Babish? Could be Nick Babich. No idea. So something I wanted to briefly touch upon. Touch upon it. When it comes to building user interfaces and microcopy. Yeah. Is translation. Oh, okay. Our product is translated into about 20 languages. Yeah. And it definitely changes the way you write microcopy. Do you mean that it makes you think about it being simple so that it's easier to translate? Yes. You also have to be careful in some cases of, of using language that in other, that could be ambiguous whether it's a noun or a verb, for example. Oh, right. Okay. Um, Have you got any examples? So, for example, the word... Read. Well, in English, read is also read. Yeah. That's confusing. Or or book, for example, could be, if a translator's looking at it without enough context, either talking about a book, or it could be a button with the label book, as in to book the venue. If someone's booking a venue, and there's a button there that says book, I don't think they're expecting to get a book through the post. (laughs) (laughs) No, but a translator doesn't necessarily see the context. Oh, that's a good point. When you're sending it to the translator to translate it into all these different languages. I see what you mean. Okay. And sometimes, yeah. depending on how you're translating it, you could add context so the translator sees, you know, this is a noun or yeah. this is relating to this. But it depends on how you're translating it. Yeah. Um, so so if you give a translator the word read, they don't know if, if you mean read or read. Yeah. You also encounter the problem with the length of strings as well. Oh my God, this is my problem. This is my problem with translation. Mm-hmm. If I've got a website that works perfectly fine, it's all nice and responsive and there's just enough room for for the text but then translate it into german or turkish turkish was the one that we had real problems with because some of the words are very very long and it can really take up quite a lot of space on the screen and then that has a knock-on effect pushes other things down it might not fit in the space that you've got you might have to make the turkish text a little bit smaller than everything else than other languages if you're designing for translation from the start though generally speaking well what we do is make our interfaces flexible to accept any length of, of string yeah so that the button will just grow wider if the text is longer i agree yes you can think about it but you won't be able to make it look the same which is i'm fine with but when i've got to show this to my boss who then shows it to a client the client might be like ah oh, it doesn't look how it looks in the design well how do you mean look the same like clearly there's going to be physically different letters there yeah or different potentially even a different alphabet but I, I know but if you're translating a phrase which is short and snappy in English into another language where it doesn't look short and snappy in that other language it might be really really wordy in which case if you're using a big title that goes over the an image for example then it just might look a hell of a lot more wordy than you were expecting and that can affect the feel of a page I'm not just talking about things like form elements I'm talking about like landing pages where the look of it is is important true there's things you can do obviously it's not it's not something that you can't fix it's just something you've got to think about I think that's a, a problem in design that, I, that we face quite a lot, though, because quite often we'll have a design done by the designer who is working to a brief but doesn't yet have the copy. And all of a sudden, when you have the copy, it's just a word too long to fit in the space that he's designed. And you try and cram it in, and then the design doesn't work anymore. Yeah. You lose the, the balance in the design. The visual impact is gone. Yeah, boxes that were square are now, too, are now a lot taller yes. because you've got a lot more text in there or wider. 
So I found some funny sign translation fails, okay. which I think a sign is microcopy, right? Yeah, I think so. So here's one that's a Chinese sign from a toilet cubicle. And I think it's trying to say that the flush lever or whatever it is to flush the toilet is behind you. Yeah. But it says toilet button is on your backside. <laughs> is it really? <laughs> One thing that we should say about microcopy and UX writing and things like that is that you should probably test it. Yeah. Because some things work, some things don't work, some things work a little bit more effectively. And so that's the sort of thing that you could A-B test. So as in show one version to some users and another version to some other users and see which one performs the best, which is useful if it's an instruction or if it's something that you're trying to use to entice users to click or to take that action. So one phrase might be much better than another. Yeah, well, we looked at that one earlier with the Google hotel booking we where did, they yeah. managed to increase conversion by 17%. 17%? Just, just by changing the text on a button. Got an example here of a change from a button that says request a quote to request pricing and it caused a 161% increase in conversions for one company. That's amazing actually. Yeah. So we did a YouTube video a while ago about in-browser notifications. So where it says, would you like to receive notifications from this website? That sort of thing. So I read an article by Mozilla, the non-profit behind the Firefox browser. And they said, the notifications prompt is by far the most frequently shown permission prompt. But not even 3% of these prompts get accepted by users. Most prompts are dismissed, while almost 19% of, of prompts cause users to leave the website immediately. I would as well. <laughs> well, I... no, I wouldn't, but I do always say no. because It's really annoying because I'm just I'm there for some information. I don't want to receive notification prompts that might come and See, pop up is, at any point. This is the problem. It's an abuse. It's an abuse, isn't it? And it's annoying, actually, for people that you want to use it legitimately because that API could be useful. I use it on Google calendar if you go to google calendar it says can we send you notifications i say yes please do that and then if i'm using my my desktop and an event is coming up it will show me a note a desktop notification yeah perfect example and I, would not, I would not like to lose that however so many times i'll be browsing the web going to a news site and it will say do you want notifications i'm like no I, this is the first time i've come to your site yeah. why would i want notifications what's the best that happens there you tell me every five minutes that you've got a new article it's just gonna be annoying or probably you're gonna spam could you even spam I don't know who you are. You could be spamming me with adverts every few minutes. I don't. Why would I consent to that? Yeah. Do you even know how to turn them off? Oh, you have to like go right into the settings. Yeah, it's quite settings. difficult. Yeah, it's yeah. not. It's not obvious. If you accidentally accept, it, I don't think it's an easy way to undo either, which is easily done. Yeah, it is easily done. Yeah, especially when you're used to like dismissing all the cookie notice notices, where you just go, yeah, 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 yeah. I just want to get to the content, but then you accidentally press yes on a notification. So around that topic, yeah, slight tangent, but something I think is relevant. Got so it. the company that I work for built one of the most popular cookie banner solutions. Oh, we're talking about it, are we? Well, I think there's something relevant here because we, okay, we had a bit of a discussion about how you request permissions from a user. As okay. part of this. And I think it's relevant. So as part of having a cookie banner, you are usually asking for the user's permission to set some kind of analytics, social, cookies, whatever they are on their computer. Mm -hmm. And the problem with most of the existing solutions there is that it pops up at the beginning and it says I want to set all these cookies and whether or not that's required for what you're doing or not you have all you've got is a binary choice of yes or no yeah and if you go on some newspaper websites and things like that they're particularly scary you you know there's hundreds of these third parties that you know ad networks social plugins analytics platforms that you individually have to look at and you know you've essentially got to consent up front even if in looking at an article that never even gets loaded oh right okay yeah right? because I've been to a news website before where you have to accept otherwise it won't let you see any of the article what we were exploring at the time as part of this cookie plugin is the idea more around what Android moved to which is asking for permissions in the context that they're needed so I don't know if you remember early Android I was quite an early adopter of Android and what used to happen when you installed something from the Play Store is it would say this app needs access access to the microphone and the camera and the data connection and all these scary things and if you're installing a game for the first time or an app for the first time you have to without even having seen the app say either, yes or no either say yes or no right and it has all those permissions all the time what i really like android made a change a while ago and i really like this change so now you install an app and you don't have to say yes to anything you open the app and then permissions are requested as and when they're needed so for example in facebook messenger it opens and it'll say this will require a data connection you say okay and then you look at your message 
messages or whatever and that's fine and then you go to into a chat with someone and you say right now I'd like to share a picture with them and it'll say we now need access to your file storage would you like to grant that but for a user you know at that moment why you are granting that access yeah if it was an installation and it said I need access to your files you go well, why does a messenger app need access to my files no yeah. I'm not installing that why could that possibly be necessary but when you do it context aware like I'm sharing a picture and then it says oh we need access to the media on your device you go oh of course you do okay but yeah. you go actually take a picture of me now it says oh we need access to your camera you go, oh, okay I understand why let's grant that access so I think it's being context aware is really sp- really important for getting the accept rates up if your goal is to get someone to accept this permission yeah you know you got to remember that a permission is there for, in the first place because it's potentially something the user would not want to do that's why it's there that's why that restriction is in place if you want to get that rate as high as possible make it context aware you know ask people in context so going back to the cookie thing we were talking about is how yeah. much better would it be instead of having a cookie banner that pops up when you first visit a site instead have it pop up and say when you first visit and all it says is we'd like to use analytics on this site to track you are you okay with this yes or no right right and you can say yes you can say no okay you then browse the article you then go to leave a comment on an on a blog article and as you click to leave a comment it says in order to load the comments we need to set third-party social plugin social cookies or whatever you didn't come up with something more concise micro copy for that <laughs> but it but it's context aware so the user wants to leave a comment that's when you ask their permission you don't need to ask it before you don't need to ask up front i see where you're going with this but you're just making someone press accept multiple times rather than just once but if you're giving someone a, a, an option to opt in or opt out i think you'll get a much higher opt-in rate yeah if you if you do that if you just popped up at the start saying we're going to set some cookies for these 100 things except or deny well i just click if you're giving me the option deny yeah i don't it's know also, maybe maybe a lot of people are pressing yes though maybe it's it's also it's fine it's also moving to more of an informed consent model because part of the data protection law that's come in to to require cookie banners is making sure people are informed about accepting cookies on their device are we are Why? we really talking about uh, data protection legislation because well, i'm pretty sure now. everyone's fallen asleep okay including me wake in up minute. my little girl says that if you can pretend to be a sleep you go, Wake up, Daddy! Wake up! Irrelevant. <laughs> bad, bad usability, usability nightmares. nightmares! This week's bad usability nightmare is brought to you by Ramune Carbonated Soft Drink from Japan. All right. Are, so... they, are they sponsoring it? Are they, are they paying us some money or, or giving us lots of no, drinks? No, I wish. I wish. So, no, so there's a... My friend Robert sent us a video about going to a sushi restaurant right. and having a Japanese imported soft drink. And I think, I could be wrong, but I think the drink is called Ramune, 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 something like that. Okay. And it has an unusual design of bottle, which he was describing to me, and I will now describe to you, our listeners, <laughs> um, about how unusable it is. It's quite an unusual bottle. And it actually influences the nickname of of this drink outside Japan as well. So the bottle, instead of having a lid, like a normal bottle, has a marble in its neck or a glass kind of ball in its neck. And due to the carbonation of the drink and the pressure, it's sort of kept in place. You know, a bit like a, an aeroplane's doors go out, um, like closed from the inside out so that when the carbon's pressurised, they're like form a plug. Right, okay. Burst it. Do you know that? So it can't burst open? No. And also, I don't know if that's relevant. Okay, but sim- similarly, <laughs> the, it's almost like um, the doors on a, a lock. You know, a, a lock in a canal. Oh, right, okay. That sort of lock. They're made in such a way that the pressure of the water against them keeps them sealed. Oh, so right. So the okay. more the pressure, the greater the seal. Right. It's, very, it's quite clever. So in a similar way, the pressure from the carbonated drink forces the ball to want to push outwards and it gets stuck in the neck, okay? And that seals the drink. So in order to open it, what we have to do is... Put push really hard on that gla- on the ball in the neck so it goes inside and over so you're pushing harder than the pressure inside and then the ball like drops into the neck yeah okay and then we can theoretically drink it okay but there is a, an unusable problem here well hold on a minute i've had this drink okay and it took me ages to figure out what to do you couldn't even work out how to open it yeah, the waitress just sort of like left it and she said, do you, do you want me to show you how to do it? And I was like, uh, no, 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 I'll figure it out. Come on, I'll, I'll sort this how out. How hard can it be? How hard can it be? Exactly. Now, for ages, I was, the, it comes with like a sort of lid, right? It's not the lid that holds the liquid in, but it's, it's a kind of lid. And I'm looking at that in my hand and I'm going, wow, wow, this must be useful somehow. So you've actually had one? Yeah. Because I've only heard this described from my friend Robert. So what you have to do is the lid sort of comes apart and then you have to sort of twist that round and it has a, like a little 
poker, a little poker thing. Then you put that little poker thing through the neck of the bottle and then slam it down. And that's what slams the marble down into the bottle itself. But it doesn't go all the way into the bottle, does it? it like, no. It gets caught in like a wider part of the neck. A narrower part of the neck. W- wider than the bit where it was against the edges causing the seal. Okay, I see what you mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah. narrower than the main bottle, but still part of the neck. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So what's his problem? So his problem was beyond that, that when you try and tip it up to drink it, the marble then rolls back into the neck, creating the seal again. <laughs> Didn't so, think about that. So, well, did you not have that problem when you had it? No, I think it just kind of got stuck somewhere. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, for, for him, he found that every time he tipped it up to drink it, the marble would run from a lower area where it was wide enough for the liquid to flow around it to block the, the neck again and stop the flow. Maybe it's a good thing. Maybe it stops you from drinking it too fast. Maybe. And getting all burpy. Um, the nickname, by the way, outside of Japan is Marble Soda. Because marble of the, Soda, the that makes sense. Ball. I've got to be honest, what's wrong with a normal bottle? Well, but I think wasn't this invented like a thousand years ago? True. And it does sort of add interest and drama, doesn't it? Like <laughs> Drama? Well, it does. I never thought you need drama in a bottle opening experience. But, but, but it's an experience. <gasps> opening a regular bottle is not. Wow. And some people probably would buy it just for the novelty factor. Yeah. It's probably not practical long term, but you know, it's different. It's like opening a bottle of champagne. There's drama there. There's peril because it might fly off and hit you. I've never ever had that. It's never been that. It pops off then, isn't it? Not really. It's not there's not that much force involved. All right, okay. Well, I thought it would like go like a mile in the air. I think only if you vigorously shake the bottle of champagne. Yeah, like a Formula 1 driver. <laughs> So yeah, thank you, Robert, for sending that video in. If anyone else has a bad usability nightmare they want to share with us, then let us know. Can I tell you a train story? Now, this has been sent in by Russ Troester. Okay. Now, he was on a train. It was a commuter train in America from Utah to Ogden. Okay. And so this train has a, a door with a button on it. Hang on. I think it's on the outside, but it might be on... Okay, it's on the outside. So it's when you're getting into the train. Now, instead of pressing this button, apparently you have to knock on the button. What? Well, exactly. That's the weird thing. And so the the icon that's next to the button shows that you have to knock. What, like, knock, 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 can I come in? Exactly. Yeah. So it has a picture of a fist that's knocking and it has the word knock to open. But it just looks like a normal button. And so he, he was really confused... I assume everyone's going to be confused. What, <coughs> do you press it? Because it's just a it's just a touch button. We're used to pressing buttons. We press buttons all the time. But yeah, it definitely says to knock to open. Why? What? I, I don't. I don't know. I can't Is find it... out why. It maybe it's a normal thing on this this route of in America. Maybe someone who knows could could send us an email or a tweet or whatever. But the only thing I can think of is that maybe that's some sort of standard convention that it used to be that you knocked and then when technology comes around with to allow us to press these buttons, they've kept that tradition. But it's a bit of a strange thing, I think. That anyway, does sound really odd. But it's not a nightmare or anything. I just thought it was a really strange quirk of, of yeah, something. Yeah, that's just confused me now. That's a mystery. Please do write to us if you know why the train has a knocking door. <laughs> So anyway, that is the end of the podcast. If you've seen or used something unusable recently, we want to hear about it. You can email us at podcast at the unusable.com and we're on Twitter at unusable podcast. If you've enjoyed this, there's plenty more. The last episode we talked about sound in UX and on YouTube, we've got a video of us playing a game called user in your face, which is like a demonstration of incredibly frustrating user interfaces on websites. Music is by gold 5472. Please subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts and you'll get a notification about the next one. Okay, that's it until next time. Bye. Goodbye.